I'm going to try to give you a large scale picture of what agriculture can do for our planet, what the natural world has been doing for a long time, and how we can work in concert with that to make how we grow food the answer to climate change. So I'll say that again. Organic farmers and organic farming is the answer to climate change. You hear a lot of stuff from people about pumping carbon dioxide into the ground, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, the engineers love that. The farmers can do a really good job, and we can do it quickly, and that's really what we're being faced with. So if we get the first slide there, oh, he's opening it. Okay, I did get this as a full hour-long presentation, and I've whittled it down to about 20 minutes. It has a mixture of science, philosophy, and uh, some practical advice. It was originally more food, smaller footprint, earth system science, and biological agriculture. You can also call it organic agriculture and climate change. The speaker who Bill had originally planned for this little time slot was going to talk about sustainability. So I thought I'd put in my version of sustainable agriculture. It's growing food, fiber, and fuel now without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. That means it has to be low toxicity. It has to have a very limited impact on bees, for example. We know that bees are in serious trouble now, and we are largely to blame for that, so we can fix that. Uh, we can't contaminate groundwater. Alika talked about the groundwater contamination that's going on here. The H. Poco wells are contaminated and are uh, currently unusable. And mostly, we have to preserve and build soil. And I'll say that a bunch of times in the next few slides. So some of you might not know what Earth System Science is. I was a geologist. I lived and breathed this for like 20 years before I came down here. Earth System Science embraces chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics, and applied scientists, a science in transcending disciplinary boundaries to treat the Earth as an integrated system. Earth System Science provides a physical basis for understanding the world in which we live upon uh, and which allows humankind the ability to seek to achieve sustainability. It's holistic versus reductionist, it means we look at all the connections between us and the world around us. And most importantly, we see ourselves as part of the Earth. Those of you who know a little bit about geology, you might have heard of like the Jurassic or the Triassic time periods when different animals lived on Earth. The most recent time period, tongue in cheek, is the Anthropocene, uh, which was proposed uh, as from uh, drunken geologists that we should call this the Anthropocene because humans are having such a large impact on the planet. At the time, it was just considered tongue-in-cheek. It's now being seriously considered as the name of the current time in which we are in. You know, those of you who are into permaculture will go, well, you know that Earth System Science stuff, that sounds kind of familiar. If you've read uh, any of Bill Mollison's work, he uh, eschews the uh, system approach, a philosophy of working with rather than against nature, a protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless labor, of looking at plants and animals in all their functions rather than treating any area as a single product system. It's an integrated way of looking things at things. It's essential to understand the local system and view ourselves as part of it. We're collaborators. We're not the boss. We're not the master. Lots of different names. Organic agriculture, biologic agriculture, regenerative, eco-agriculture, biodynamic. There's a lot of similarities between Earth System Science and permaculture and agriculture. So what kind of impact have humans had on the planet? Well, I decided to get a picture of Earth from space at night. We're one of the few, if not the only species, that produces a lot of light at night. We've clearly had a pretty big impact on the planet. We've also had another big impact on the planet, and that's the production of carbon dioxide. This shows carbon dioxide concentration over here versus thousands of years from today back to 800,000 years ago. This is a reconstruction of all the fluctuations of carbon dioxide until you get to human activity and boom, it goes up to where it is now, 400 parts per million. We have uniquely affected the Earth in a very big way. Greenhouse gases coming from agriculture are huge. We should be the solution, but we're part of the problem. 
17 to 32 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions come from so-called modern, predominantly conventional agriculture. This includes carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane. We're currently in a bit of a pickle. We're at about 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We need to be down to about 350 parts per million, which is where we were about 10 or 12 years ago, in order to keep our planet from having some really serious climatic effects. This shows the summer ice cover, 1979, in the North Pole. Here it is, 2007. We're making a really big impact on the planet, and it's not something to be proud of. The solution, in my humble opinion, to rising carbon dioxide and climate change is soil regeneration, carbon sequestration, and the byproduct is fabulous, healthy soil. This is also called organic or regenerative agriculture. It's growing soil. I'll show you a few things about uh, things that we can do, ways we can harness the, the past to do this. Soil. What is soil? Those of you that take my uh, sustainable agriculture class have probably seen all these slides. This could be a picture of a road cut right down in Haiku here, soil on the top, some of the weathered bedrock here, and then some of the unweathered material down here. Soil is this thin interface between rock and the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. No soil, no food, unless you can eat like not many of us are good at that. Soil is the mother of all terrestrial life and every nation's most strategic resource, yet we treat it like dirt. Business as usual is not an option when it comes to soil, food, and people. It's time for a greener revolution. This is Dave Montgomery. He's a geologist. He studied how fast does soil erode. He's one of my heroes. This is a typical soil profile with lots of organic material in the upper part, the mineral soil here, and the relatively unaltered material down here. This is an article that Dave wrote, and he asked the question, is agriculture eroding civilization's foundation? He found, as a scientist, that the rates of soil erosion are 10 to 100 times faster than the rate of soil production. So those of you who uh, have elementary math will understand that we're uh, mining the soil today to feed ourselves, leaving future generations incapable of doing the same. That's not very sustainable. Franklin, whoops, sorry. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the last uh, president who, uh, I'll be blunt, really gave a shit about all this. Um, he formed the Natural Resources Conservation Service. His uh, minister, it's not a minister, secretary of agriculture was brilliant. The guy would have fit in amongst all of us here. You don't see that in Washington these days. Will Rogers, cowboy poet, capped it another way. They're making more people every day, but they ain't making any more dirt. The ideal composition of soil, 25% air, 25% water, 45% mineral, and 5% organic matter. The 5% organic matter doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you multiply it over the global acres of agriculture, which is 40% of the total land area, it's a big deal. The organic matter consists of living organisms, fresh organic residue, decomposing organic matter, and humans not to be confused with ground up chickpeas, which is hummus. <laughs> Another way of thinking of all this is that there's the living, the dead, and the very dead. It's the very dead that we want to build in our soil. It locks up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. How does that happen? This thing here called the soil food web. It's solar powered plants and their debris provide the original food for bacteria, fungi, and nematodes which in turn are food for protozoans, nematodes, arthropods, etc., etc. We also have worms in here. One of Charles Darwin's greatest contributions to the world was the long-term study of worms. He estimated that in a typical acre of healthy soil, there's 1.75 million worms. Collectively, they could weigh more than the cows that are grazing above them in that field. Pretty amazing. A lot of people don't like uh, centipedes right here. There's a one dandy right there that this guy's got in his tweezers. They're a healthy part of our soil e ecosystem. They're kind of like the sharks. So when you have a very diverse ecosystem, you have uh, a marine ecosystem, there's a lot of sharks because there's stuff for them to eat. Same thing for these guys. So how does this feed our farms and how does it feed the forest? You don't see people going out and fertilizing forests, right? But stuff manages to grow somehow. Okay, we can reduce all of us down to a very simple ratio of carbon atoms and nitrogen atoms. Oops. Bacteria has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 5 to 1. Fungus is 20 to 1. People, 
green leaves and protozoans all come in here at 30 to 1, and then most of the other stuff has a lot more carbon in it. Why does this matter? Because we have microorganisms like this that live in healthy soil. This is something called vorticella. It's a really cool little uh, protozoan. Its gut right here is packed full of bacteria. So it needs to have a 30 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So to get all that carbon, it has to eat six bacteria that are the ratio of 5 to 1. So now it's got this ratio of 30 atoms of carbon, 6 atoms of nitrogen. The carbon is OK, but there's too much nitrogen. So that protozoan does what you and I do, gets rid of it. It releases it as waste. It comes out as ammonium. This is either used by plants directly, or some bacteria convert it into nitrate, which plants can use. So everyone knows that cow manure, hog manure, whatever, horse manure is a good fertilizer for your garden. Think of it this way. On my farm, most of my cows are single-celled organisms, and it's their manure that is feeding my plants. I use about 20% of the recommended rates of fertilizer, mostly because we have an exceptionally active soil food web that is feeding our farm. We're taking advantage of the natural world. A healthy soil food web provides invaluable ecosystem services. Besides plant nutrients, you also get improved water retention. Here's 100 pounds of soil with only 1 to 2 percent organic matter. It can hold about a half an inch to an inch and a half of rain. 4 to 5 percent organic matter, it can hold 4 to 6 inches of rain. Great for water storage. I think it comes out to about 19,000 gallons per acre per percent of organic matter in your soil. Right? So um, that's a big deal. We should be getting tax breaks for increasing the organic matter in our soil. It also re results in decreased soil erosion because we get particle aggregation. It improves the ability of our soil to hold nutrients. The fancy word for that is cation exchange capacity. And it builds soil organic matter, which is carbon sequestration. This is what the engineers are scrambling to do to take atmospheric carbon dioxide and get it out of the atmosphere. An easy way to do that is to put it in your soil. So healthy soil has texture, aggregation, structure, mineral balance, and life. And most importantly, you have to grow it. You can't like call up a truck and say, yeah, give me about 40 acres of good soil. And you could, but it's going to be expensive. To get soil like this, you have to grow it. It took us about three years to make a big dent in our farm, and it, we're still growing. OK, we're going to talk about the part of the planet that is below ground, that's in the soil, all the roots here. This is about 15 feet right here, and this is up to 6 feet here. This shows you know, a couple of different prairie grasses, and here's all the roots in here. It's a huge ecosystem. Every time you look around at a tree, remember that what is below is the same as what is above. It's a lot of biomass. That everything that's below is the rhizosphere, the area around the roots that are affected by root secretions that plants give off. The soil food web is most active in that area. 5 to 20 percent, 21 percent of everything that a plant makes in photosynthesis gets pumped down to the roots to communicate with microbes, to feed microbes, to uh, talk with other plants. This is a 400 million year old co-evolutionary co relationship. So if you're a plant and you're a microbe and you're working together for 400 million years, there's probably, you've made a lot of mistakes and you've figured out the most efficient way to do what you need to do to survive. It's quite a contrast to the last 40 years of plant breeding and genetic engineering. I'm just going to show you one example here of something that I always find kind of amazing. Plants, and particularly microbes, have the ability to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. It's a type of microbe. It's called rhizobia. Rhizo means root. Bio means life. They make these little nodules. It's typical, typically found on legumes, such as clover. You could find it on koa trees. You might find it on, on the roots of monkey pod trees. We're blessed with a lot of it here in the tropics. This is the way it works. If you think that plants and microbes don't talk to each other, here's a, a root with a little root hair. The root hair is giving off flavonoids. You've heard of bioflavonoids. They might be in, in the food that you eat. The flavonoids go pss, pss. They talk to the rhizobia, and the rhizobia says, oh, I know these guys. Right. The rhizobia releases these things called nodulation factors, which causes a deformation of the root. The rhizobia move in set up shop, and then start fixing nitrogen to make these little nodules. They're living off of the carbohydrates and sugars that the plant produces, and in exchange, fixing nitrogen that the plant wouldn't normally be able to get. It's a great relationship. It's been around for a long time. 
we should be making use of that instead of uh, fertilizing. I'm always amazed by simple things in life. This is a molecule of nitrogenase. It's an, uh, an enzyme. These are all folded proteins, and they've got different metals stuck in the middle of them. It takes inner atmospheric nitrogen and makes it into ammonia. You can't make protein if you don't have ammonia. Uh, this amazing process was developed by bacteria that do not have a nucleus, perhaps as long as two and a half billion years ago. It's a longer story that goes into that, but um, this process is two and a half billion years old. It accounts for half of the bioavailable nitrogen uh, in extant life. It's an amazing opportunity for us to use the natural world to produce nitrogen for our food. But what do we do? Uh, Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch came up with the Haber-Bosch process. It basically mines atmospheric nitrogen to produce fertilizer. It produces 500 million tons of artificial fertilizer a year. It's a lot of fertilizer. It still sustains about half of the population. What are some of the problems with that? Here's a list of the side effects. You get nitrogen runoff because this is all water-soluble fertilizer. There's 87 million acres of corn in the Midwest. That's a lot of fertilizer, and that's a lot of fertilizer that gets dissolved. It's not very efficient. Only 40% of it actually goes to the corn. The rest of it is either runoff or turned into emissions of nitrous oxide that go back into the atmosphere, which are way worse than carbon dioxide. It causes a eutrophication or the depletion of oxygen in our water bodies and acidification of our soil. This is the Mississippi River Delta. All the green stuff out here is a bloom of phytoplankton from all this runoff coming from corn farms in the Midwest. This is another view of it. Here's the Mississippi River Delta here. And this shows the distribution of phytoplankton in the Gulf of Mexico. In the heat of the summer, the, the uh, dead zone down here is about the size of Rhode Island, where, micro, where organisms can't live because there's not enough oxygen. This shows the number of reported oxygen-limiting environments versus time. Right about here is when Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture, said, we're going to plant fence line to fence line, we're going to subsidize all the farmers. And you can see we started to get a lot more negative effects of runoff in the occurrence of a lot more of these areas that are limited with oxygen. So we're kind of pooping in our own bed, right? Another microorganism that's really good is soil fungus, highly underappreciated. Some of you, the next time you're in your garden or on your farm, look around for these guys. They're called bird's nest fungus. This is a big chunk of uh, Kupa'a farm soil. There's the bird's nest fungus here. Here's all these nice little light white uh, hyphal strands in there. This is what the, they look like if you uh, have a very high power microscope. All these little bits are along here. And what makes these hyphal strands white is little bits of calcium oxalate. Fungus, uh, soil contains about as much carbon as all the plants in the atmosphere combined. Must, much of this is mediated in fungal life forms. Fungus formed, uh, formed soil glomalin. It was only discovered about 20 years ago. 60% of soil carbon is contained in glomalin. And so the fungus is a key part of aggregate formation, nutrient solubility, and fixing. Uh, unfortunately for us, it's really sensitive to soil pH, chemicals, and tillage. I can bet that there's more than a few conventional farms that use all that that don't have much fungus in it. So it's a very incomplete soil food web that they have. And they're not doing anything to lock up carbon dioxide. This is one of my favorites, and I put this in for um, Harriet, who's next. Here's a cross section of a root, and then there's a little pie part that's taken out of there. This pie part here, so here's the outer part. All this purple stuff is a type of fungus called mycorrhizae. This is what it looks like in the little stain section. It's all these little strands right here. Myco means fungus, rhiza means root. It is a symbiotic root fungus that lives on the roots of most plants in the world. Somehow the broccoli family missed the boat on that. It enhances drought tolerance and improves water storage, nutrient availability, plant communication, and may provide pathogen protection. This is a potato plant that has mycorrhizal fungi on it, and this one doesn't. Planted at the same time, same plant. This has been around for a really long time. Here's a modern little fungal uh, shrub right here, a modern plant. 
And here's one in a microscope uh, section taken from a rock in Scotland that's 410 million years old that probably had the first plant in it. The first time we see plants making the step from the oceans to the soil is in association with this fungus. It's a, it's a, an, a long time hooey where the, the two components got together to allow each other to survive. There's a couple of other things agriculture could be doing to lower greenhouse gas production. Compost, we could use a lot of compost. Believe me, it is, and Bill can attest to this, it's a battle to try to get Maui County to buy into composting food waste. We produce 27,000 pound, 27,000 tons a year of food waste. That's all in the landfill. Kupa'a Farm, make sure that about 30 tons of that goes to our farm instead of the landfill. Food waste averages 27% globally. It's the third largest source of greenhouse gases. The sooner we can get it into our soil, the sooner we can feed the soil food web. Uh, that's a win-win in terms of carbon dioxide going both ways. And you've heard Vincent talk about biochar. I'm not really going to go into this, but there's a lot of possibilities for that as well. Okay, so what can we do? Agriculture philosophically needs to embrace the biology of the soil and work with it, period. Right now, if, if you go and you say, well, I'd like to learn about growing tomatoes, and you go to, say, the Florida State Extension Office uh, website, and they'll tell you how to grow tomatoes, the first thing you do is fumigate your soil so it's sterile. Okay, that's not embracing the biology of the soil. We have things like cover crops. We can use no-till or conservation tillage. We can use compost, microbial inoculation, crop rotation, minimal chemical disturbances. We have all the technology right here. Uh, this is drilled corn in which they didn't incorporate or till over the uh, last year's debris. They just used a seed drill to drill it right in there. Very low erosion rates on that. The Rodale Institute calculates that proper stewardship just of agricultural lands could absorb the current levels of human-produced di uh, carbon dioxide. That doesn't even include looking at uh, pasture lands. So I would really recommend that you go there to the Rodale Institute, and they've got a nice paper on that. This book here is brilliant. The Farm as Ecosystem. Uh, everyone should read it. Eaters, policy makers, farmers, etc. And then there's a lot of hope for the future. We talk about young farmers. Here's young scientists. This is a class from Utrecht University, 2013. And they're looking at their, this is the whole class on microbial interactions. And it's fantastic. These are people that are starting to learn about how microbes interact, how we can work with them to grow our food in a more responsible way. The technology is out there. I'll conclude with this. This is a quote from the Rodale Institute. Climate change has provided an unparalleled opportunity to harness cutting edge technological understanding, human ingenuity, and the rich history of farmers working in tandem with the wisdom of natural systems to arrive at a stable climate by way of healing our land and ourselves. Let's get going. Uh, this is a beautiful quote to me that uh, sets us on a path forward. Thank you very much.